uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill, I know you started as a, a stand-up comic. The, do you know how studying the science of humor, here's the joke, how is, this, how is studying the science of humor like dissecting a frock? I don't know, Ira. <laughs> how? <laughs> here it is. Few people are interested, and the subject always dies in the end. Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 Woo! <laughs> Comedy's that simple, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that actually, that actually was a quote from the author E.B. White, but I, I know you must have a theory about what makes something. Well, let funny. me just point out about the E.B. White. Yeah, the same guy before, um, before Harry Potter, before J.L. Rowling, the same guy who uh, wrote Charlotte's Web was here to for or there to for the most popular children's book in English. Right. That same guy was the editor of the New York Times, and so I just. Th- Wow. So when he writes a joke, I, I respect it, okay? <laughs> and uh, I just try, I'm troubled, uh, incidentally, as a side note, if you ever read The Elements of Style, the thin little mm-hmm. book about grammar, I will never write anything as good as that essay that he wrote right. in the beginning. That right. aside, I strongly believe comedy is based on expectations. And there, you were talking earlier in the show about the unconscious and consciousness and um, of a mind and so on. And so uh, comedy is generally based on stereotypes, which is expectations. And I, I'm convinced that your unconscious mind's anticipating what's going to happen, and then the joke is not what you anticipated. All right. Let's, let's find out about that theory with uh, my next guest has written a book about what makes us laugh and what's going on in our brain when we hear a joke. Is it funny? It's a great book. Scott Weems, he's a research scientist at the University of Maryland and author of the new book, Ha! The Science of When We Laugh and Why. Uh, welcome to Science Friday. Well, thank you. Thank you for having S- me. Scott, how, how, how right on was Bill on his thesis about why we laugh, what makes something funny? Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of have to say, he, yeah, he was right on. He didn't have the complete story. Uh, expectation is definitely important. I would say that there's no rules for humor, but that there are certainly ingredients. And expectation, if I were to list them, that would be the first one. It is. Because first guy goes into the bar. The second guy goes into the bar. Third guy goes into the bar and and <laughs> blank. <laughs> yeah, you. I mean, you expect that joke, right? I mean, there's a whole history of people going into a bar jokes. Right. And so, you, yeah, you instantly know you're in a joke. And you, that's the great thing about some humor is you've got an expectation when you start word one because you know something like that is going to happen. All right. I've got an, I got, I've got a, an example of something like that. Let me play a very famous, famous joke. Uh, this is you, you all recognize it when you hear it. One morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. Wow! Now we need yes. the rim shot for that one. That's the famous... Don't drink that poison. It's four dollars an ounce. <laughs> the Groucho Marx line. Why? Uh, why is that funny, Scott? I, I love yeah Groucho Marx, and it's a classic, maybe the most quoted you know comic line there is. And I would think, I mean, Bill's right when he says there's expectation, and I love that joke because. Uh, it's so short, and that's exactly what he does in, like, you know, 15 words or so, that you build an expectation, and here it's who's wearing the pajamas. Because at the beginning, as you'd expect, you think it's Groucho. But somewhere around word 12, something happens, and you realize that that expectation is wrong. And so if I'm listing ingredients, I would say you have to have expectation, but you also have to have a destination, too. And that in that joke, the destination is trying to imagine an elephant wearing pajamas, which is, I think, intrinsically by itself humorous. Mm-hmm. So what's going? let's talk about what's going on in our brains when you think something is funny. And I want to focus in on uh, a really interesting part of your book that you talk about dopamine, the role that dopamine plays in our brain. And you say it's the currency that allows our brain to operate. Humor taps into the brain's pleasure production system. Is, uh, yeah, I mean, in this way, humor is, is essentially a natural high, and we, we use that phrase a lot. But here I'm using it in a neuroscientific sense in that uh, dopamine is basically our pleasure chemical. You you get it when you eat chocolate, uh, when you do anything pleasurable. Um, I mean, it's actually also linked with certain drugs like cocaine. Uh, that's why I call it humor a natural drug is because when you show people humor in the form of cartoons or maybe even just a verbal joke, uh, you get an increase in dopamine in the brain. You you can put someone in a scanner and see these dopamine-producing centers light up. And so, and you'd get it for other things, too. Like if someone listens to particularly emotional, meaningful music to them, the kind that brings on 
like epiphany type moments. You get dopamine responses there too. So that's why I think humor is really part of a much larger cognitive process of, of discovery and like mm-hmm. Bill said, expectation. And then there's that that sudden revelation and our brains like to experience revelation. So then, so then are we basically, because you say dopamine made us who we are, physical and intellectual thrill seekers, always on a lookout for some new way to improve our lives and make ourselves laugh. So are we... If you want to sum total, uh, boil our, uh, us down to our essential, are we dopamine junkies? Uh, is that what we do? Yeah, in a way we are. I mean, there's actually, it's, it's called, there's one theory, it's called the dopamine mind hypothesis that says that, you know, dopamine production in our brain essentially skyrocketed when we turned into uh, civil uh, society-based, you know, civilization-based creatures with, with interactions and and, and complex behaviors and hobbies and, and fun things to do and skydiving and kayaking and who knows what. That we, we now have the, the fortunate position in our controlled society that we can go and, and have fun and seek out experiences mm-hmm. that are beyond just surviving to the next day. And we like that squirt of dopamine in our brain. It feels really good. Now, you have actually discovered in your research the funniest joke in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. Tell, tell, tell. that right there just is like, just, just like, messing yeah. with that, my Bill likes to change the world. He always talks about changing the world. The, this is that's, so the Monty Python thing where they read the uh, <laughs> joke and the other guys laugh to death. Yeah, well, one ha, of the tell funniest how, Monty Python bits. Yeah. Tell us how you good. found that, and or who found the funniest joke in the world. Yeah, so I can't claim right. I can't claim credit for this. This is Richard Wiseman, a, a British psychologist, and essentially what he did is Richard uh, Wiseman. See, wise man. See, coincidence. Yeah, yeah. Huh. We got, got to get that. And so what he did is he he ran an experiment and like a huge one, which is what he essentially does. That's 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 who he is. And he set up a website and asked people to submit their favorite jokes and also to rate other people's jokes. And thanks to some publicity and international attention, he got uh, like thousands, tens of thousands of jokes were submitted and millions of responses and judges. So. So from that, he was able to get tons of data, which is fascinating in some ways because not only did he find the, the one joke that was rated the highest, he, he saw some other things like if, if jokes included a duck, they were funnier than if they included something like a llama. Because if you get enough jokes, you can compare what happens if you get a, a duck version versus a dog version or well, something Well, like so that. does anybody talk about ending in a K or a stop? Oh, yeah, that yeah. duck. I mean, in fact, you've, you've tapped on something there, Bill, because there's debate whether chicken or duck is funnier. Because if you ask Mel Brooks, he says chicken. But if you ask Richard Wiseman, he says duck. So, And, and the Marx yeah, Brothers got them both in. Buy, buy a duck, buy not a chicken. You know? I know. As long as it's not a llama, then you're good. I mean, just, I, I'd say Llamas can be funny. It just, you know, they're just, they're reclusive. Well, get, take, get it. So tell us how. So what, what is the, the fun- funniest Yeah, joke what is the funniest I won't say dying to and, know, and but make fascinated. Sure you, you, you tell it so we can retell it. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, that's another reason I think why it won is it is a joke made for retelling. The only thing is I would let people know my background is science, not comedy, so I'll do my best, but there's expectations when you say that. Uh, it starts with two hunters are off in the woods, and uh, all of a sudden one of them just he falls to the ground, and he's, he's holding his chest. He's not breathing. It, it looks really dire. So his friend, in a panic, he calls 911, and the operator picks up and says, yes, sir, what's your emergency? And the hunter says, oh, my gosh, I think my friend is dead. What do I do? And the operator is very calm. She says, okay, sir, first I need you to calm down, check and, and make sure that, that he's really dead. And so there's a pause. And then, bam! Mm-hmm. And then the guy comes back and says, okay, that's done. Now what? Yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> first, don't don't blame the teller. I, I'm not a great joke teller. Ma- there's a there's a tendency towards it's... mediocrity when you ask a million people anything. Um, also, but, this is not a bad. Group. This is that's great. Yeah, this is a group, is group link, yeah. self-selected, though. These are online people. Yeah, the, the most yeah. common joke, the one that yeah. was submitted the most times in the thousands, what's, uh, what's brown and sticky? Uh, a stick. So it could have been worse. <sighs> well, yeah, they could've, It could have been worse. Been a lot worse it could, yeah. it so uh, Steve Martin uh, wrote, I thought eloquently about this, that when is the funniest moment in your life is when you choose, the, it's the moment when you choose to laugh. And it's encapsulated by the expression, well, you had to be there. Mm. And this, I, to me, Steve Martin was the master of that, of creating that tension where you just weren't really sure <clears throat> if he was with you or not, if he has, had drifted off and then you had paid money to see him and that had this, uh, mm-hmm. what we nowadays call dissonance. 
Mm-hmm. And so then you had this expectation that uh, wasn't being met. I will say, back in the day, Ira, the first guy I ever saw that that uh, did this thing that Groucho Marx was so... The first guy I was ever in the room with was A. Whitney Brown. Do you remember him? Mm-hmm. I hope someday to be the Whitney Brown, that mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, every joke, every punch word was a setup for the next joke. And there's this thing in stand-up comedy, if you can get to 10 jokes a minute, that's good. That's right. extraordinary. And that's, uh, it's really hard to do. It's, it's really worth respecting. I get no respect. He used to, he used to get well, 10 jokes. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't get no respect. What was his name? Who did that? Rodney 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 Dan. Dan. He did 10 in a row. He could do that's what, by heavens, yeah, he yes, fast. he did. By the stars, yeah. he did. Let's talk about what, what makes non-jokes and absurd jokes funny. For example, is a joke. We were talking about this in the office before we came here. What is green and has wheels? And you don't know? Yeah. Grass. Well, I know it. I, uh, a grass. I lied about the wheels. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's so funny it's, you bring that. I actually asked my wife if I could say that one on the air in an interview, and she said, no, that's <laughs> terrible. You cannot use that as an example of absurd humor. I don't get it. But, yeah, but listen how we're all laughing. Why are we all well, laughing that. about that? Well, I'm laughing at you laughing, which is yes. the whole sympathetic thing. Yeah. And I, it's I think much the, funnier to see a funny movie in the theater, yeah, than at home, where mm. other people are laughing around you. Right. And uh, didn't you... Well, didn't you guys, you researchers, didn't you do stuff with um, bonobos and gorillas? Uh, well, there's there's tons of research on that to show that uh, you know laughter and uh, surrounded by other people, it, it's it's contagious. And there's all sorts of manipulation. So the closer you are to the people, the better you know them, um, the, the more you laugh. So and mm-hmm. and it does go to apes and I think I mean even rats too. I mean they, all these creatures they laugh. Yeah, uh, Rats laugh. We'll talk about that in a second. Rats I have to laugh. remind everybody that I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with Scott Weems, author of Ha! The Science of When We Laugh and Why. And also Bill Nye, the science guy, is here. Yeah, in your book you talk about they you, you they tickled rats and, and they, they laugh at a really high frequency. Uh, yeah, 50 kilohertz, apparently, I guess. Uh, the, the researcher is Jeffrey Bergdorf from, I think it was Chicago. Only teenagers can hear it. <laughs> oh, not even, <laughs> not even teena- teenagers. Uh, you also mentioned in your book, uh, you, Bill, you talked about laugh being better in groups. You start your book off about contagious laughter that went on for in a town. It took over a whole town for like 18 months. People were laughing. Something like that? Uh, yeah. It's incredible. It was, I think, 1962 or so. So No danger of epidemic. that happening during this <laughs> broadcast, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Yeah, it was, I think, in the end, over 1,000 people were affected. And it just started at a, at a small, I think it was a missionary school for girls, and three of them started laughing, and then their friends, and then their friends. And I mean, it essentially almost shut down the whole country. This was Tanganyika, now uh, Tanzania. And, I mean, no one knew. They call it a mass psychotic episode. But I think you can actually learn something from that um, in that this was a really big time of radical social change for the children, both in uh, desegregation and, and local versus um, versus British rule. And they were all also mostly mostly young girls just mm-hmm. under pure, puberty. So they essentially their brains were were driven by conflict it was all about conflict they didn't know who they were anymore and and i'd say that if you know talking about humor ingredients that are necessary uh conflict which is really closely tied with expectation uh that's that's pretty key so we so we laugh because we're conflicted about what to do if we're in a situation we just give a little laugh because we don't know how to get out of it i i I don't i don't know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'll so just, yeah, that's that's what it is. I yeah. think, it, yeah. and you can look at the brain and see the conflict centers of the brain in a region called the anterior cingulate, responsible for dealing with conflict. That's the one almost universal brain area that's activated for uh, jokes. Can you develop that? I mean, by that I mean, um, when you look at a uh, brain scan, MRI style thing, can you see people develop their conflict is this conflict resolution or conflict uh, acceptance center well it's it's the region that deals with conflict and then tries to find a solution essentially so if you're you've got a couple different ways of taking a, a statement or a, a question this is the region that'll that'll sort out your options and and choose the best one and you can't i mean there's not been any study that i know of that has built people up 
in their anterior cingulate activity. But there's plenty of studies to look at who has bigger anterior cingulates than others and, you know, why. <laughs> and here's where you get into some really touchy political and religious stuff. I'm not sure how much you want me to get into. Must be male scientists doing uh, this. I was say, yeah, maybe. My uh, anterior is this big. Yeah. Hey, so hey, cingulate. Yeah. So what is the political implication? What are you saying? What sort of controversy are you stirring up here, doctor? Since I brought it up. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you can actually look at anterior cingulate size and see that people of liberal persuasion tend to have larger anterior cingulates. Um, and I say oh, tend to. On. like it, 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 oh, it, that's, that's science. In fact, to make it even harder to believe, this was a British research study that was, uh, that was of the researchers who did it was Colin Firth, as in the actor Colin Firth. Mm -hmm. Because it was his idea to do it as part of a BBC broadcast and look at this. Because he just mm -hmm. wanted to prove what he already thought about the people, you know, that he was mm -hmm. dealing with in these political party. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Jarrett Reese from the uh, university there said, "Well, at, let's do real science." And they did real science. And it turns out, so liberals have larger anterior cingulates, and people who are more conservative they have larger amygdala, which is a more of an emotional center, which might explain how political ads for different parties sometimes are, are very different in their approaches. Hmm. Well, uh, reading into this is, is always uh, tough, but, I mean, yeah. you can't debate that well, at least the regions have been observed. Well, I'm going to segue to reading. Your book is not tough. Uh, the book is called Ha! The Science of When We Laugh and Why by Scott Weems. It's really very interesting. I start, you know, I, I read the book and I start dog-earing the pages. I gave up because I dog-eared so many pages I wanted to get to. I just gave up trying to dog-ear the pages. Thank you very much, Scott, for taking time to be with us today. It's really it's just a fantastic topic. It really yeah. is. Fa I think it just says so much about what it is to be human or maybe what it is to be a rat, uh, to, be, <laughs> to live You're good on, with in human. the world. Yeah. All right. Well, Bill and I want to thank topic. you. Thank you, Bill, for dropping by. Oh, no. Uh, smoothing with us this hour. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have you back. Bill and I, uh, America's engineer. Uh, we, you, 